We're going to continue talking about renal physiology and we're going to focus primarily on the loop of Henle. And we can see here that the loop of Henle consists of the thick descending limb, the thin descending limb, and it continues to rise within the thin ascending limb and the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And we can see from a functional standpoint that the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle is involved with the reabsorption of the electrolytes or ions and cations and it reabsorbs within the vasa recta or the capillary structures and also another function of the loop of Henle is to create the countercurrent multiplier in which it sets up the potential and possibility for water reabsorption within the collecting tubules under the influence of the ADH, or the antidiuretic hormone. So we can see here that the loop of Henle is involved with the reabsorption of electrolytes such as sodium chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Likewise, it's involved with the reabsorption of water. And another functionality of the loop of Henle is the countercurrent multiplier. So we can start off by saying that the thick ascending limb, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and if we were to say that this is a loop of Henle cell within the thick portion of the ascending limb, and we were to magnify one of the cells, the first thing that we should see is the reabsorption of sodium. And approximately 25 to 30 percent of the total ultrafiltrate that was created by the glomerulus. So if we were to backtrack and look at the very beginning of the nephron, and we were to say that the nephron at the Bowman's capsule, the ultrafiltrate that was created from the plasma and enters into the proximal tubule, we said that 65 to 75 percent of the sodium is absorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. So as you transverse down and enter into the loop of Henle, we can say that approximately 25 to 30 percent of the ultrafiltrate actually reaches to the ascending thick limb of the loop of Henle. And out of that 25 to 30 percent of the total ultrafiltrate, about 15 to 20 percent of the sodium is reabsorbed into the cells of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and ultimately reabsorbed back into the capillary system and it enters into the systemic circulation. But we can see here that the driving force comes from, once again from the sodium potassium ATPase. This is the active transport of sodium from within the cell, from then within the tubular cell or the loop of Henle thick ascending limb cell drives the sodium from within the cell into the capillary vessel. And that requires energy in the form of ATP. And through the sodium potassium ATPase, three sodiums exit the cell and enter into the circulation system. And approximately two potassium ions leave the systemic circulation from the capillary vessel into the cell. And because sodium is leaving outside the cell, it drives a concentration gradient of sodium from the tubular lumen to enter into the cell once again. And that driving force with the co-transport of potassium along with chloride drives these elements or ions into the tubular cell and eventually gets absorbed into the systemic circulation via the capillary through another co-transport channel. So this is one of the mechanisms that where a loop diuretic, since this is a loop of Henle, a loop diuretic, for example, furosemide or Lasix, binds and inactivates this channel. And primarily there's four binding sites within this channel. You have one binding site from the sodium, two chlorides, and a potassium. And chloride is considered the rate limiting step 
And in fact, it's the Lasix furosemide that binds to the, cal the chloride uh, part of this interaction and prevents this mechanism from taking place and therefore allows sodium to continue to remain within this tubular lumen and eventually as a diuretic draws the water where you're excreting larger amount of water in the urine and therefore works as a diuretic for a treatment for hypertension. Next we'll look at the loop of Henle and we'll look at the countercurrent multiplier. So we can say that the descending thick limb of the loop of Henle and the descending thin limb of the loop of Henle along with the ascending thin limb of the loop of Henle are permeable to water and to solutes. So as you go and you go further into medulla where it becomes more and more concentrated the fluid, the tubular fluid or the ultrafiltrate becomes more and more concentrated. And that continues until you start to rise in the ascending limb and because the water is able to permeate through the membrane as you go higher and higher up the fluid becomes more and more uh, or less and less concentrated rather. And you can see here because sodium is being actively transported out of the cell the fluid within the ascending limb, in fact the fluid that's leaving the ascending limb of the loop of Henle is considered hypotonic in which it's roughly around 100 to 200 milliosmoles per liter. So the fluid that's leaving the loop of Henle is considered hypotonic and the important aspect is that the medulla portion is hypertonic. So what happens is as the tubular fluid travels and now goes towards the collecting tubules, it sets up the potential for the reabsorption of water under the influence of the antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone we'll talk about later when we discuss the collecting of tubules allows for the passage of water to get reabsorbed into the capillary vessel within the medulla and the driving force is that hypertonic very concentrated environment within the medulla aspect of the kidney and that was due to this counter current multiplier that was created because of the permeability within the vessel walls or within the tubular walls of the descending thick limb descending thin limb and the ascending thin limb water permeability of the walls but the impermeability of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle along with the active reabsorption of sodium creates a hypotonic tubular fluid and a hypertonic interstitium within the medulla. And because of this hypertonic environment water is easily driven to get absorbed back into the capillary system and therefore increase the blood volume. And examples in which you would have a, a secretion of antidiuretic hormone is situations for if you were to have for example a decrease in blood volume or a decrease in blood pressure that would stimulate the antidiuretic hormone within the pituitary gland in hopes to reabsorb the water and increase your blood volume and therefore increase your mean arterial pressure. In the next lecture we'll talk about the distal convoluted tubule and the function of the distal convoluted tubule in regards to the reabsorption and the secretions of certain cations and anions.